Hello and welcome to Talking Technophobia. All work and no play make me professor movies. And tonight we'll be talking about Stanley Kubrick's 1980, The Shining. Uh, so uh, here's some stuff we're gonna kind of touch upon tonight. I really think uh, this is a movie about stories and I'm gonna try to, by the end of this, kind of give us some time to contemplate the power of stories in this film. But since we're talking technophobia, we're going to open with a little technology and talk about what's going on there. I'd like to talk about mirrors also. Um, I think we've also, like, just even before we started, we were saying a little bit about like alcohol, alcoholism or abuse, and that's a good thing to touch upon with this. Something I like about this movie is uh, how real it kind of seems up until a certain point, and I think that that's uh, something worth discussing as well. Um, and then we'll finish with whatever other ideas or connections we want to bring into it, whether that's uh, the miniseries or the book or stuff like that. Like, when we get to the end, we can totally open up the discussion to those bigger elements, because this movie does not exist in, the ba in a vacuum. And as always, we're thinking about what this movie is saying about technology, but also um, what this film tells us about where we're at with film in 1980 in terms of the technology that's being used to produce it there, um, and how this film reflects aspects of our culture today, but also back then. So here's Johnny. Um, this is me. I've been a big fan of The Shining. I often make the joke to people that it was my childhood. I'm not quite sure what I mean when I say that. I don't mean it in like a negative way at all. I am dressed like Jack Torrance tonight, but I, I've always like identified with Danny more. I don't know if like I had an imaginary friend as a kid or not, but I got the shine, you're right, you're right. I know things before they happen. Uh, there's a sketch of Danny I drew. Um, it's not really photo accurate, but I tried one day a couple of years ago. And working in public school, you would find blood in all kinds of random places, just like in the Overlook Hotel. So that's what's going on in that uh, sink over there. Um, yeah, I don't know. We vote for the poll for the next month's movie every month on my Instagram. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, it's, it's something that happens. Um, and LMC kind of tries to keep us all aware of it. So here we go. Um, the Shining, in case we've forgotten, uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick. He co-wrote the script with Diane Johnson based on the novel by Stephen King. Uh, I think we're all pretty much aware that Stephen King was not a fan of this movie, and we can talk a little bit about that if you'd like. Uh, came out in May of 1980. Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, looking the prettiest I've ever seen her look in this movie. She's very handsome. Scatman Carruthers, I like him a lot in this film. I think he's a really strong character. Movie made a decent amount of money in North America. It's technically classified as a psychological horror drama, which, again, I'm not quite sure what that means. Hello and welcome. Come on in. Um, this was one of the first handful of films to use uh, dollies for tracking shots, and there's a lot of tracking shots happening in this film. I really like how the camera is a bit like a ghost that's following these characters around at times in the movie. Uh, disowned by Stephen King, sequel, Dr. Sleep, R book was written in 2015, I think, and um, movie comes out next month. Movie supposedly is taking both the book and Kubrick's movie and seeing how they both kind of coexist. I'm gonna say Kubrick, you wanna call him Kubrick, that's fine too. Um, I'm New York born and I'm not gonna pretend that I'm classier than I am. So that's how I'm gonna refer to him. <laughs> But tomato, tomato, really. Um, and this movie has given rise to many a conspiracy theory, which I would like to maybe not talk about. I'd like us to talk about some of our own conspiracy theories. But if you must talk about the moon landing, let's, let's see where it goes. All right, so opening, opening from the opening scene of the movie, uh, I want to show you a little bit the interview because I really do believe that this story in a lot of ways drives everything that we see happen after it. And then after this, we'll talk about some technology. Okay. So I show you this kind of like out of context and I'm just going to let it like ferment for a little while. I'm going to, I tried something different today where uh, for this, this discussion I, I kind of grouped a couple like clips together instead of looking at one long scene. Uh, part of the reason is like the pacing in this movie is very like it's a slow burn, um, and I was looking at like clips that were like seven to nine minutes, and I, like 
So I tried something different. You're going to see more of the interview, same parts, parts from before and after throughout. But really, the story of Charles Grady, I kind of just want to put it out there and let it sit for a little while. And we'll hear back from Mr. Grady in a little bit. Um, so coming away from that and talking about technology, so here's, here's how I see technology in The Shining. Um, in our own culture, we have become increasingly reliant on technologies in the forms of uh, communication and transportation. And what that does is it really provides us with this false sense of safety. And that once those technologies are removed, uh, real danger and isolation uh, can start to emerge. You can see this in The Shining with um, Jack uh, Torrance use of sabotage uh, with the radio and the snow cab, but there's some other things going on too. Um, and really what, that, what the film is showing me is that we, uh, we really fear the failure of our familiar technologies, right? Like that once those things are taken away, we don't know how to exist without them. So we'll see, and we'll talk about that. Um, so with that said, and then we're going to talk, what technology? The fuel and the taxes they were building it. So, uh, there's a lot of technology in this movie, even if it's subtle or not. And when I present to you with like these examples, I think uh, it, the message and the uh, what's being said about like technology like becomes a little clearer. But also, that might be unfair to do because I'm editing. I'm presenting you everything linear that's happening in the movie, but I'm totally removing things and cutting things out. Um, so things that we can talk about is technology other than what we just saw, uh, technology outside of the film, uh, like in terms of the production. Um, but I really do want to steer us then towards like the impact of how technology is being shown, what it's saying about our relationship to it. And as always, feel free to disagree. Um, so what do you guys think? Um, either technology in the movie or outside the movie, things you notice? Yes, ma'am. So one thing I noticed in the opening shot of the film is that it's just one single car driving mm. into nature. And there's, uh, in the scene, uh, the car is coming up against a tunnel, which to me signifies the end of the technology that these people will have available to them. Mm -hmm. And you know, while there, you showed us a couple scenes and there were techno was technology involved, sure. um, ultimately there wasn't really much that they could use to help them out of this situation mm -hmm. or help them at all in this situation. So I, I really liked um, the, the beginning, the, the credit scene, um, when you can kind of visually see how the film is going to be. Yeah, it's, it was a good it's almost like the journey away from like civilization. Yeah. And, that, and nature is a big uh, force in this movie. Uh, I think you're on, you're on to something there. Uh, even in the end, right, Jack in the maze, uh, out in the cold, in the snow, but also the storm that knocks out uh, the phone lines. Like, again, think back to what we talked about Jurassic Park, right? Like, the idea of the storm, it's nature reacting to something, usually, mm, equalizing. Mm -hmm. All right, very nice. Other thoughts? Other ideas? Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Um, Mostly technology seems to be in the film mm -hmm. to um, underline the isolation that they yeah. have um, by way of what's being taken away over time. They have the phone lines, then they're gone. They have the radio, then it's gone. And some of the other things mm -hmm. you know, do the same thing. Um, but that isolation is broken by Danny and his like psychic connection mm -hmm. to... Um, O'Halloran, mm -hmm. and really what it shows is, you know, another type of connection that breaks through that isolation. So, yeah. I mean, it's possible to look at that and say, well, on a story level, just on a, like, plot device mm -hmm. level, there's at least one final connection that can't be broken yeah. technologically. Um, and that sort of ties into more of the supernatural roots of what's going on here. I, I really like that. And I and like we definitely I want us to to debate, right? Like psychological versus supernatural with this. Um, as you're saying that, I'm reminded of uh, when we talked about a new hope and I'm wondering like is Danny a Jedi? And I'm 
I'm not really making a joke with that, right? Because it's like the force is this thing that's older than the technology, this thing that's superior to the technology, and like the shining, the psychic ability that's there is kind of treated in a similar way. Um, right, Luke blows up the Death Star not using the targeting computer, but using his own, like, like trusting himself and his own, like, human abilities. And that's something, like, we see with Danny. Um, maybe Jack, I don't know. I, I see a little bit of that, too, there with him. Uh, other thoughts? Thank you for that. Yes? So, I guess from outside, from the filming technology itself. Yeah, please. I know that Stanley Kubrick developed a lot of lenses when he did, uh, the movie before this, uh, Barry Lyndon. Barry Lyndon, because he used it, natural light. It's all yeah. natural light, and a lot of this is shot in natural light. Not mm -hmm. all of it, there can't be all natural light, but there's, it's not a lot of technology even being used in the sense of the filming of the movie, yeah. which helps make it feel isolated, like the scene at the outside is shot basically at low light, natural light yeah. at night. Um, a lot of the hallway scenes, I mean, only the big room scenes have a little bit of special yeah. effects in natural light, but otherwise, he uses natural light and the dusk settings and stuff to, to help you get isolated. And he spent like five years developing lenses just to actually Yeah, he did. Like that. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, Everett and then Sharon. I just want to say? Yes, sir. O-U-S-I-D-E. Oh, very good. <laughs> what happens <laughs> is, <laughs> that's good, that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there were at least three more typos that I caught prior to this starting. And the problem is I'm sitting in my car, connected to bad Wi-Fi, uh, also trying to animate and have something else. I'm trying to multitask. And like, yeah, I don't know. Good job. If you can find it in my work, you should be able to find it in your work too, though. Okay? Yep. That's right. It's not a skill unless you can apply it to yourself. Yeah. Do, do you have something more to add? Or? No, that was Okay, it. very good. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. I felt like he isolates by safety. Mm -hmm. So he sets up the situation where you think you're safe, he mm -hmm. shows you everything, and then you're not really safe. So for example, it's a bad storm, mm -hmm. and she's talking to the police department, you know, in a parallel, and they're in a nice, cozy, they're not even out. Mm -hmm. So you know it has to be bad if the police officers are out, so how is anybody gonna get there? Yeah. So that creates further isolation. No, absolutely. And like, yeah, the Mr. Ullman, who like gives them the tour, he's like, oh, look, here's the snow cats. It's going to solve all your problems. You drive a car, you're going to be fine. Yeah, don't worry about it. Worst comes to worst, you can always just go down the mountain. But it is. They're on this top of this mountain, cut off from everyone else. Um, and yeah, maybe in the production, like uh, limiting the technology that's being used, using natural light and stuff, is kind of like helping emphasize that. All right. Other thoughts? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, then there's that whole scene in the beginning where they're showing her the freezer full yeah. of food and all the dry goods. Mm -hmm. And all I was thinking about was, and this was like in the car on the way up to the place, they're talking about the Donner Party. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you went there. And then they show you all this food. I'm like, OK, I guess that's not a problem. Yeah. The uh, that, like idea of like when push comes to shove, we we will eat each other, right? Is another like one of those themes that is, that comes up again and again. He says, "Oh, we take all the alcohol out when we close the place yeah. for the winter," and I'm thinking, uh "Oh." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a long winter. And again, what's what's frightening about that is like these are the people you love, right? And like the people that love you, we'll spend enough time with them. Things might start to change, uh, which is what's really scary about this movie to me. Because I'm like, I could see how that happens. And then the Donner Party is another one of the stories that we get, right? Like, because this is a movie about stories in a lot of ways to me. Um, okay. Uh, other thoughts? What, any anybody? Anything else? We want to talk about dollies or cameras or lenses, typewriters. I think it's only like. Yeah, it was one of the first ones, yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to go there, too. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I think uh, I had touched upon it a little bit right before you guys came in. It's like, I feel as though the camera is like this, the ghost that's following you around in this movie, right? It, it creeps through the, uh, past the corner when, Den when, she's, looking, when she's looking at the, the pages J Jack's typed towards the end. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, and sometimes you feel like there's another person like coming up, and you feel like they're reacting to another person, yeah. but there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing there. 
Danny on his tricycle. He's like running away from the camera and he just can't get away from it. Um, and it's always at his eye level. Yep. Yeah, no matter, no matter who it is, yeah, it's always on your level. It's not looking down on you. Right? There's that quality that's being applied there with the shot. That reminds me. Mm -hmm. um, because you have steady cam, there's a slight difference you can see sometimes between when the camera is being used steady cam and when the camera is being used handheld. Yeah. And as far as I know, Kubrick went out of his way to shoot all the handheld scenes in his movies himself. Yeah. So there really is like an authorial idea of the camera is coming from somebody's point of view. Yeah. And completely disconnected, but the uh, idea of the steady cam shots being some sort of ghostly perspective. Yeah. It reminds me of like there is a game that was famously can canceled um, like in the Silent Hill series. PT. Yeah, PT yeah, that go ahead. Kojima was doing. And people like went in and they dug in the code mm -hmm. um, because they were noticing some weird things in like the way like they felt like they were like the thing that's following you. And they actually found that in the code there is this invisible thing person mm. that is there's actually a physical model of a thing, a zombie that's following your first person perspective the whole time. Yeah. Presumably there because, it, you know, it produces some lighting effects where you can see, like, the shadow of something. Yeah. And that's something that I think probably owes, you know, might just be disconnected. But yeah. It, you know, it just reminds me of some of that going I, on here. I stole, so I always tell people I made of movies, I stole that from Kojima. Like, that's how Kojima describes himself. Kojima made video games, for those of you who don't know. Yeah. Um, Metal Gear Solid, things like that. He's got a new game coming out. He was trying to make a, like a horror game and it got canceled because there were some issues with the studio he's working for. Um, and it's probably totally influenced by The Shining. And I hear that those demos are worth a lot of money because mm. they pulled them from the PlayStation stores. Yeah. So if you got one, one day, eBay, make some, <laughs> make some money. I've got one. I've got one. Um, the snowcat comes and saves them at the end. Yeah, Danny um, calls using The Shining, but it, like the arrival of the snowcat, right, is is like that beacon of hope. Um, so, and then it's not about hollering because he's he's there to save them and then fails, right? As soon as he walks in the door, and it's, they're able to escape with that snowcat. And let's just bring it back to technology one last time before we talk about some mirrors, because I love the mirrors in this movie. Um, both the literal mirrors and then all of the figurative mirrors that you run into as you watch this movie in terms of characters or dialogue. And it's also anyone who's ever done any shooting, like it's tricky to shoot with mirrors in, on your set. Um, it's also dangerous, right, because of glass and stuff. But it's impressive in terms of the camera work. But it's also, there's enough mirrors in this movie that I would say that there's some kind of authorial intent being used on the part of the filmmakers. Uh, yeah, um, and like it was just a matter of time. I, I was trying to keep the clips under. Oh, I'm back. Okay, I'm supposed to let them know when the clip's going to end. I was trying to keep the the clips like short, um, believe it or not. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff like you're going to see. I'm like I'm skipping over, but I'm trying to just give you a gist of things there. Um, so I want to remind you that I really think um, film is a mirror in and of itself, right? And that's kind of like my thesis behind like talking about technophobia and everything, that movies both project and reflect aspects of our culture, right? They show us what's there, but they also put stuff out there as well. Um, so that's in my mind also watching this with the mirror stuff, um, literal and figurative mirrors, the twin girls. Um, but what do you think about the mirrors? What mirrors did I miss? Um, why could they be important? Or why is it just really good set direction? Yes, sir. I think at one point there was, Danny was in front of the mirror and she wasn't being reflected. Oh, OK. There was one yeah. Vampire? When, like when well, he yeah. wasn't, when it was Danny isn't here right now. Yeah. I think it was during that part of the movie. Oh, that's really interesting. Hmm. OK, so I wonder like how that could fit with the other kind of stuff there. Did yeah. you have a thought? Um, let's see. Well, first of all, I think it's interesting. Mirrors have a pretty big place in a number of other Kubrick movies, yeah. too. There's always that bathroom scene, right? But yeah, right. go ahead. Right, right. I mean, like, 
there's um you know some of the mirrors in a clockwork orange especially the you know the double mirrored hallway mm -hmm. that you know they when they break into the author's house at the beginning um there's also the mirror from like that famous shot slash trailer for eyes wide shut and i'm mm -hmm. pretty sure there's some other mirrors too yeah. you know like nicole kidman she's dancing in front of the mirror mm -hmm. um um, beyond that, one thing that popped out to me while watching this, sure. and it's something that happens throughout the movie, I'm surprised, you know, first I was thinking, I'm surprised there's so much Disney stuff mm -hmm. in this Warner Brothers film. It's mm -hmm. something you wouldn't have had today. One of the conspiracy theories that people have talked about with, you know, The Shining is the Disney stuff. We made it 41 minutes before a conspiracy theory. That's pretty no. good. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's good. That's much better than I thought we were going right. to do. But it's like the Disney stuff... <laughs> Connects to the little pig, little pig, little oh, okay. woman, and like the overtones of anti Semitism yeah. in that cartoon. But the thing that it made me think of here, you know, re Disney, mm -hmm. is what's in the first Disney feature, Snow White. Yeah. The mirror. Mirror, yeah, mirror, mirror. mirror. So huh. there's a very prominent focus there. Yeah, and what does that mirror do in Snow White? It shows them right. whatever they want, right? And right. in Beauty and the Beast, they got the mirror too. Mm -hmm. It just it shows you whatever you desire, whatever you want to see. Um, it's kind of like a future thing. We're gonna go behind you, and then Greg. Yeah. Uh, well, there's also in Harry Potter the mirror of Erised. Yeah, and it, yeah. Which gives you your heart, shows you nothing more or less than your heart's desire. So that's like a motif that seems to like be used often in cinema, right? Uh, Fantasy, I'll even go as far as saying. Um, what do you think well, so about mirrors? Go ahead. I have a, I have, a, I haven't really thought this all the way through. It's okay. Just watching these scenes. Yeah. I know that there's a discussion coming up later, and it comes up like whether or not this is all psychological in yeah. his head, or whether there's actually supernatural. So yeah. at some points, there's pretty clearly supernatural, like unlocking the door from the outside. Yep. And that's the uh, thing that my argument falls apart with. Yeah. And there's some other, there's some other times, and there are also times when it's pretty clearly starting psychological and drifts into supernatural. Maybe, yeah. And a lot of times it starts with a mirror scene. So like where he's talking at the bar, mm -hmm. he's clearly talking to himself because mm -hmm. there's nobody in the room. And it starts off with him talking <coughs> to himself and then all of a sudden there is a ghost there. So it, it starts with a mirror scene yeah. and turns into something that borders into the supernatural like kind of using the mirror as like an inflection point to get to the other side. Of no, you're, you're absolutely right. And how does that scene end, right? Well, Wendy runs in right. and we, the camera angle shifts and there's nothing there. It's just him in the mirror again. Yeah. Yes. The same thing happened, I guess, with, with the part where he's talking to himself and he starts to get disjointed. You're seeing it through the mirror mm -hmm. when he starts to use the shining a lot of times. Yeah. At least two of the scenes okay. where it goes from him something's going on <laughs> in his head till something's really happening because the call to Halloran is really happening. Presumably, it, really it would. Be, it is presented as such, it's and I would argue, in the yeah, movie right? that it actually occurs. So, mm -hmm. We um, are we are made to believe that The Shining is real. And so right? a lot of times, the mirror looks like an inflection point, kind of like in The Matrix, mm. where like he puts his hand in the mm -hmm. mirror, and it goes from being like a lot of stuff that's going on in his head to being real. I, that was always like a, mirror, a so. scene I wondered about in The Matrix. So this is kind of using something similar. I'm not sure they stole that here, and I'm not 100 percent certain it holds up in every scene. Right. But I just from what I was watching there. So. No, that's cool. Um, and I'm not sure that even what I think holds true to all of the mirrors either. But like again, like I've watched this, like paying attention to those mirrors, I'm like, oh, okay. Like a lot of Jack in the beginning is just shot through the mirror, right? Like Wendy bringing him breakfast, the scene with Danny, less so, but like that whole Wendy scene is shot into the mirror. Right? We're just seeing Jack through the mirror. What are you thinking? Um, kind of bringing up the games again, mm -hmm. uh, one of the Silent Hill games in the franchise actually did have a connection with mirrors as well. And yeah. I feel like a lot of those games are influenced by a lot of um, horror movies, horror science fiction writers and everything. So mm. in, in one of them, it's kind of like your character is walking through this world and then you kind of approach a mirror and it takes you into the like the equivalent of like, the upside down and mm -hmm. Stranger Things. It's like a, a different dark reflection of that world yeah. and I feel like in this it, it kind of has that similar um, vibe where it's it's like there's these two sides to Jack where you know at one point he's kind of doing okay he's normal but then you kind of see these like yeah, mirror like shots and you see kind of this like 
angry Jack or this like uh, this warped uh, psychotic Jack where it becomes kind of confusing at, at a certain point I think probably intentional with the, mm-hmm. the shots like the breakfast scene where it's completely shot through the mirror and it's just like which side is like the reality and which side's the reflection that's interesting yeah um, so that's it. yeah uh, yes sir I was just gonna say I think the mirrors are often used to uh, to kind of portray two different concepts. One is self-reflection, yeah. and one is conversation in a sense. So, mm, okay. So a lot of the times they're in the mirror, and off, we all do it, right? We look in the mirror, and sometimes you're thinking about something, you self-reflect on yourself, and you use the mirror as sort of a medium to do that, mm-hmm. and also for conversation. So a lot of times, like the young boys, Danny's talking in the mirror at the very beginning, mm-hmm. and it seems like a more palatable way to for the audience to sort of accept someone talking to themselves. Yeah. As opposed to if there was no mirror there, you kind of don't see the duality in the conversation. Whereas if he's talking to himself, it seems more um, inappropriate. Yeah, more crazy. Yeah. yeah, if you're just talking to yourself and there's nothing there. But when you're talking to yourself in the mirror, it seems more palatable for the audience to not think it's necessarily something of based on mental illness, but people yeah. talk in the mirror often. Yeah, so I know. I think he's using that in that context in different ways. And I like when you bring up uh, the idea of duality, right? Um, Two sides to something. That's something like some of us have like touched upon a little bit. And like, yeah, giving a name to it, like duality, (coughs) showing the two sides in that are always seeking balance, right? But potentially in this movie are out of balance. We'll go here and then there, yeah. And then I may have skipped someone in the middle. To me, it's it's a little simpler. Make it simple for us. Well, well Break it down. I said for me, no, it's no, a little no. simpler. <laughs> Could because, be right. Because, um, you know, he's seeing ghosts. Yeah. And sometimes you don't know if you'll see a ghost in a mirror or not. And we have a lot of superstition about mm-hmm. around mirrors and a lot of traditions around mirrors. Mm. So, um, and mirrors sometimes... Happen to be covered. I'm sorry? Mirrors happen to be covered. That's true, yes. cover up the mirrors. Yes, but all these mirrors are Don't break out. the mirror, yeah. yeah. And um, sometimes when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, you don't like what you see. Mm-hmm. So I kind of feel like it's it's used as um, mm, a, like a device mm-hmm. for s- to scare you. And it also, you know, mirrors are also used to make spaces bigger and larger yeah. and more defined. So um, I always, when he was going by mirrors or there were mirrors, I was expecting a ghost to... Mm-hmm. Like pop up in the mirror, it's, it it creates a lot of suspense. Like, okay, we're calm. He's fine. He's in the bed. You know, there's no ghost, but maybe a ghost will appear in the mirror, or maybe they won't. So it kind of creates a lot of suspense to have all of these mirrors. Yeah. In the um, and will they break a mirror and have bad luck? Yeah. No, I like that because like you're you're touching upon this idea that like uh, mirrors are really important to us culturally and have always been, right? I think of like House of Mirrors and the maze and how difficult it is to navigate. Um, there's always those scenes of those movies where it's like you know there's the mirrors and like which is you got to kill the right one. That might be in a James Bond movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> might be a clue. Um, anyway, uh, I like I like that idea a lot and. To, to continue with the idea of making it simple, right? Think of how the mirror works with Danny. He's like, Tony, why don't you want to go? And then Tony shows him something as he's looking into that mirror. Jack's looking into the mirror, and then maybe the hotel or his mind or whatever shows him something uh, with uh, Lloyd. And then the bathroom, right? He's presented with what he thinks he sees until he sees it in the mirror. What were you going to say? I was just gonna say I was thinking about funhouse mirrors yeah. and how they tend to warp things. Oh. And just and it seems like the more you go into the movie, every time he's looking in the mirror, he's looking crazier and crazier. Yeah. Yeah, I really think he's freaking out in front of those mirrors as he's walking yeah. to the gold room. And is that at the sight of his own reflection or not? We don't get to see it, but the the staging of how he's walking like seems to line up every single time with that. Go ahead. I'll take a go with the paranormal aspects of the Please. movie. Um, Ghosts are also connected to mirrors. Mm-hmm. Like if you have Bloody Mary, the Candy Man usually are supposed to stand in front of the mirror and like repeat those words and the ghost appears in mm-hmm. the mirror. So there's also that. There's something inherently creepy about mirrors, yeah. right? Because it also goes back to like Native American times. Sure. Because when the um, colonizers brought like the mirrors, they thought, the Native Americans thought they were like cursed. 
Uh huh. I forgot why, but yeah, that was like their belief that they were like cursed and they held like spirits inside. Okay. So yeah, it kind of goes back to like the Native American time. Oh, that's interesting. And we made it 51 minutes before getting to Native Americans, but that's good too. <laughs> no, that's really good. And I like that because uh, I wasn't aware of that with the mirrors, but with some of the theories around this film and um, Native Americans, right, that could be something intentional that's happening. Yes, sir. Uh, something I, I think you were mentioning before, the idea of the mirror and self-reflection, self-introspection. Um, some of the other, like another director who I think of in terms of who uses mirrors or reflections mm -hmm. like this a lot is Mamoru Oshii, the a anime director. Mm -hmm. um, and he's used a lot of, like he's used reflections, not necessarily in mirrors, but reflections in the act of mirroring and doubling in a lot of his stuff, especially like Angel's Egg and Ghost in the Shell, mm -hmm. uses a very similar conceit where it's somebody either falling into the water and falling into their reflection, or somebody floating up while they're submerged in water and looking at their own reflection on the underside. And because, you know, dealing in animation, you can make it perfectly clear on both sides. Mm -hmm. And what strikes me there in that, as regards to this, is in Oshii's movies, especially Ghost in the Shell, mm -hmm. when a character is thinking about their existence and questioning themselves and having that moment of reflection, it's on a path that is towards empowerment, fulfilling something about yourself, becoming a better version of yourself. Uh -huh. Like the major in Ghost in the Shell deciding to get rid of her, what was holding her back and become something more. In terms of Jack in the movie here, he's yeah. constantly looking in the mirror, constantly reflecting on himself, and you know he's a failure. He's a drunk. He's a failed writer who's in a job that he hates and takes it out on his son, his wife. So his encounters with the mirror wind up being poisonous. Yeah, he doesn't like what he no. sees. Yeah, he can't escape it. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll go here and here, yeah. If you kind of look at that a different way, at the end of this film, we learn, even though it's uh, touched on in, in the movie, that he has always been mm. at the Overlook Hotel. So perhaps his destiny is to become what he has always been. Mm -hmm. You do get the S, you get a sense that he is <laughs> perhaps a mirror of something that has been here before, right? In a lot of ways, it reflects like you've always been the caretaker, and I, we, I want to. We'll talk about the painting, uh, the picture at the end and that line from Grady, because I, I think that's important to consider as well. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, now I'm gonna get a little philosophical. Do it. Um, <laughs> you know, when you, when you look at yourself in the mirror yeah. and you see yourself, that's not really who you are. No. So it, what you're looking at could be what other people think you are, what you're trying to be. So I think a lot of times when he's looking at himself and he's changing, I don't even think he sees himself mm -hmm. the way that he's changing. Yeah. So I think that um, mirrors do many things. Mm -hmm. They give false images of ourselves. They, you know, we can create pe things that we are not. Mm -hmm. So um, I think perhaps the mirror is being used because... Um, what am I saying? I think that's my last. That's my okay. No, I get it. And like you think about just like uh, body dysmorphia and how many of us look into the mirror and see little fat girls, right? And I've never been a little fat girl, and it's still what I see. Um, so like, yeah, it's like I get it, you know. Um, it's, it's it's more it's more about what's going on in your head mm -hmm. than what is actually happening. Mm. So it's not so much mirrors show us the truth, right? Mirrors maybe show us what we want to see or maybe don't want to no, see? we don't even see who we are. Yeah. Because we're looking at a reflection that doesn't really re represent the whole us. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Cool. We'll go Ryan and then circle back to Jamie and then Stefan. Yeah, so sort of like um, like a, uh, like we see sort of like the mask, I guess, mm. that we put on every day, I guess, that we want other people to see mm. and not really how we think and how we would really be. Yeah. We don't really, you know, turn ourselves inside out, I guess you could say. Uh, uh, we just, you know, sort of see the cover of the 
I like that. It reminds me of uh, the book by Brett Easton Ellis, but also the movie American Psycho, where the Patrick Bateman character in the beginning of the film says, my mask of sanity is slowly slipping as he's doing his like peel in the mirror. Uh, there's another mirror. Um, but yes, you get the sense from like Jack more than anyone else, right, that he is wearing this like mask that is just slipping from the very beginning of this film. Yeah, the family man, the like, oh yeah, everything's good. I'm, I'm looking forward to this job. Yeah. I love my family. All right, I heard him once. You know, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Jamie, you're right. Thank you for keeping me true to the order. <laughs> it's this light. I, th I think what Sharon says is important yeah, please. Uh, to think about um, the way that Stanley Kubrick is filming this movie. There, there are mirrors, and we're, we're dissecting kind of scene by scene. Um, well, it's a psychological, psychological thriller, right? Sure, yeah. So we don't know watching this film the first time what the outcome of the movie Right, so mm -hmm. we're looking at this, his ref him or these characters looking at their reflection in the mirror, and perhaps what he's saying is this is not what it appears to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a very interesting point yeah. to think about, not the plot of the film, but in, in making um, the, the film. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, building off of that, like we watch it the first time and you don't know how it's going to end, or you hope that you don't know how it's going to end because the movie does uh, like practice that old dramatic technique of almost pantomiming the ending for you ahead of time, right? That story that we're given in the interview, it plays out almost exactly as it's told to us. And Jack's like, you don't got to worry. That's not going to be me. And then it is, right? And that whole time you're just hoping that's not where we're going to go. We're hoping Jack is not a mirror for Grady. Um, you know, the twins kind of are mirrors. They are twin girls who are lit. Their faces are lit opposite. And that's what it makes them look visually different. But that's about it. And then their line, come play with us forever and ever and ever, is echoed in the next scene uh, by Jack as a mirror. He says, I wish we could stay here forever and ever and ever, which prompts Danny to say something interesting. So we're going to go here and then there. Well, you kind of mentioned it, but I was like, the bigger mirror yeah. in this movie is not even a literal one. It's the narrative one of just Grady's story and then Jack's story. And it's um, it kind of is like the, the hotel itself is the mirror mm. in, in the way that previous person was there, this person was there. And who knows if like a following person would kind of come, if that would continue a cycle of, mm -hmm. of this reflection yeah, it's like history is not necessarily repeating; it's reflecting, right? It's like an infinite mirror, right? Where you're standing in front of the two mirrors, and you got the infinite, like in clockwork. Uh, Everett, and then here. Um, this also, when you were saw, talking about like in the mirror, mm -hmm. like that reminds me of Ethan Galleon when, in the original TV show, when like the at one point Shinji main character is like literally talking to himself in like a train car mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like there's two shinjis and one of them is like asking questions to the other one to mm -hmm. the actual shinji and it's like in his mind yeah and we see that a little bit with danny and tony yeah. right that kind of and then also essence. like i'm pretty sure the girls are actually eight and ten not twins oh that's a good point because that's what we're told and yet that's not what we are shown hold on to that idea yes sir um two things first of all thank you for bringing up Ethan gellion that's a nice mm. that's a nice find um, I was actually thinking of that a little earlier when I believe you said we don't really see what other people see in ourselves, and that kind of goes back to the theme that you had there of, you know, the version of ourselves in somebody else's heart versus ourselves, the version of ourselves in our heart, and that kind of all then ties back to the old idea of how Jack is perceiving himself, how others are perceiving Jack. Um, but just on one simpler level, another mm -hmm. mirror and kind of reflection that we have in the movie is literally the maze itself. If you look at the maze, I'm per you know at least from one angle and possibly from two. No, I think you're right. Yeah. Both sides, you know, it's symmetrical. Now, granted, this is how most large scale like hedge mazes are built because it's just going to take too much time to mm -hmm. design a maze that is completely asymmetrical and it's easier for people to find their way out if it's a symmetrical kind of maze. 
here also i think it just makes it easier because they only built like a small portion of it uh -huh. and they just wanted to have you know a few random the, you know pathways that they could cut together and make it look like it's a bigger thing right. but when they go into the maze it is now they're inside another mirror zone mm. yeah no that's a good that's a good mention um anything else final thoughts on mirrors I think the mirrors are cool in this movie and they're worth thinking about. Everett, I think your idea about the twins is really important because there are other inconsistencies with the story that I want us to talk about in a little bit. Yes? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that recently um, in a different horror movie, uh, Midsummer, that came out mm -hmm. a few months ago, uh, I noticed that there were a lot of like conversations relying 100% on mirrors. And it was, uh, yeah, just really something I noticed very recently and I was... Um, yeah. Yeah, it was nice. yeah, the director of Midsummer also did Heredity, oh, if I'm yeah. correct. And th that's a director whose horror movies remind me, echo traces of Kubrick in this film. Like, I see the slow burn, the slow build happening in the same way. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I was going to watch Hereditary, but then uh, my film director uh, told me, like, uh, what was it? It all represents, the monster represents STDs, and then I was like, no, uh, that's It Follows, It Follows. Yeah, that's It Follows, yeah. It Follows, don't have sex or a ghost will follow and kill you, <laughs> is the message. But horror has always advice. been used to teach morality, right? Going back to the, horror, the morality plays of the Middle Ages, um, we punish the, what society deems as wicked and wrong, and horror movies are like a release for that. Really good one, uh, Cabin in the Woods kind of is super meta in a lot of ways, but like is really like trying to put its finger on that's what horror movies have, are doing and have always been doing. It's this kind of release, but um, yeah. I saw a hand or no? I have a light, okay. Um, think about it, I think the mirrors are worth talking about um, because every time I come back to this I find some new mirrors. So let's talk about ghosts versus crazy, and if there's a difference, and if it matters. Yes, sir. I figured out another inconsistency. No, we're, going, we're getting there. Hold on to it. Save it. We're going to talk about the power of storytelling, and I, I think, yeah, at that point, like, we should talk about all of the ways, like, like, Grady's name and stuff. Like, I want to talk about that, because there's a bunch of inconsistencies. How long Jack hasn't been drinking? A lot of inconsistencies. Psychological supernatural. That sounds fine. It's in your head like, uh, like a worm. It's uh, been in my dreams the past like, week as I'm getting ready to talk about this tonight. Uh, so much so that like, I was like, all right, let me just, I'll download the soundtrack and play it on my phone as you guys come in. Um, so uh, I found The Shining frightening the first time I saw it. The book, same thing. Uh, like I said, I think this was my childhood. That doesn't mean like, I had a bad childhood. Like also, but what's really scary about this for me, and I think for a lot of people, is just how real it all could be, up until a point maybe. Um, and uh, watching this movie for the first time, I was like, oh, there are no ghosts. Um, this is good. it's cabin fever, just like they said in the beginning. It's it's exactly that. And then I'm like thinking about, it, and I'm like, yeah, and you can explain this, and you can explain that, and then I'm. But who lets them out of the freezer? And my my whole theory starts to fall apart there. And there are answers, I guess, we could come up with to trail, still try to make it work, but that is really where the movie makes the effort to say, nope, this is where we're going now. Um, or at least that's how I'm reading it. So talk about supernatural, talk about what makes this psychological. Um, go ahead. Well, I think the movie kind of, I mean, I'm not certain, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's trying to be on both sides mm -hmm. of the fence. Uh, they want you to believe it's cabin fever. Or he wants you to believe it, it could all be cabin fever, but he also wants to put supernatural into it so that it's ambiguous mm -hmm. for the viewer because I think that adds an element of like, like horror to it because your brain starts to go back and forth between the two and it can't settle down into a vein. So just keeping you on, your, on the edge of your mental seat uh, trying to get that through. But the other thing is... Uh, if you look at it purely from a cabin fever perspective, mm -hmm. it could just be that, uh, you know, there it, it's it's still a movie. It's still it's still fiction. Very it's true. It's not real. So maybe she didn't just lock the door. Maybe like it's possible that 
he wants to keep it ambiguous for the sake of how crazy it makes you feel. Because the scariest part of this movie, this movie's not scary. Mm-hmm. It's only scary when I got older mm-hmm. and I realized that I could go crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what it's like. It's so, like, like you're seeing a guy go crazy. Day. This is what's happening. So, if you were going crazy, you would start to see things like ghosts yeah. for real, yeah. or you would start to believe that there was a ghost there that opened the door for you when mm-hmm. in fact there was a coincidence that occurred and you don't know it. And I think that he's the kind of director who might throw that in so that it really could just be cabin fever. But because he's trying to tell a story and put the viewer in mm-hmm. the seat of Jack almost. Because, I mean, if you're trying to scare somebody, you want them to be in Jack's mental state. Yeah. I mean, that's really where you want to put the viewer. And from Jack's perspective, you know, he there, there are ghosts. I mean, there's like the weird bear guy. Yeah. And all kinds of other bizarre things that he's seeing. And that could all just be in his head. So there is a way to view this that it's entirely mental. But I'm sure that the director was trying to make it ambiguous enough that it disturbed you while you were watching it. I think it's definitely a, a purposeful choice. Uh, there is rumor of a deleted ending with Wendy and Danny in the hospital, and then Mr. Ullman comes and visits them, and it's kind of like, not not wink wink. I was I was in on it the whole time, and like they didn't. Right. I think it. I've heard rumors of this. I've never actually seen the footage. Um, other things outside the movie. Uh, Stanley Kubrick. Says he doesn't believe in ghosts. Told Stephen King that. Um, I think it's a purposeful choice to be ambiguous. I think that's a, a, a Kubrick staple in a lot of his movies. It's high culture art is what he's making, right? For maybe low culture audiences, but he's trying to bring some higher philosophy or other things here. Um, we're gonna go here and then here. Go ahead. Um, I think uh, it's what kind of uh, scared me originally about this movie is also this kind of feeling of, um, I saw it later, mm-hmm. um, so it was more of this feeling of kind of not being able to kind of escape this certain fate, Yeah. Um, and he obviously has a history with Danny and, mm-hmm. and, and the family, and it's kind of like in that opening interview with, uh, you know, Ullman, mm-hmm. he's kind of saying like, you know, you know, we're, we're going to have a good time, everything's going to be fine, and he's trying to kind of put that behind, like, move forward, and it just slowly throughout the movie, it's just kind of pulling back into that state. Um, and I think also the, 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 the whole psychological versus the paranormal sure. kind of thing, also, it's there, like we mentioned before, is like kind of being two sides of the same coin, and... Um, I liked in the recent, the, the Netflix ha- uh, Haunting of Hill House, mm-hmm. they kind of um, talk about ghosts in a way where it's not specifically these like spirits. Sometimes ghosts are just like a memory, an addiction, yeah. a problem, something that haunts you in that sense. And I feel like that could kind of be this same element here where it's these ghosts of this place of like certain things that have happened here, something that he brought with him um, yeah. kind of is fleshing out in that sense and it's just like that scariness is that you don't know if it's psychological or something else or if that something else is influencing your psychology yeah is it the place or is it the people or is it both yeah Sharon I, well my first we'll go to you. Yeah. Uh, response was what is reality Oof. that's the first thing so Who let you in here. <laughs> You're bringing s- philosophy, fucking but, existentialism. But it, but, Go ahead. But but it's but it's true. <laughs> None of us know the capacity of the brain. None of us mm-hmm. know the capacity yeah. of um, this reality at all, do mm-hmm. we? So I think that maybe his ambiguousness was I don't know what's true and what's not true. Yeah. I know that this happened, I know that this happened, and I know that that happened. Yeah. But that does not mean that none of it's true or none of it's not true. So the other thing is um, I've had instances where, you know, I needed something for the store from the store, and my husband has bought it home mm-hmm. without me putting it on the list. Mm-hmm. So what is that? Yeah. I mean, is what is it? Got the shine. Um, no. <laughs> That's what it is. No. no. Okay, I don't, don't fight I, it. I, I mean it in 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 a yeah. in the sense that 
Synchronicity. We don't know. No, no. not even that. Okay. We don't need. We don't know the capacity of the mind. Mm -hmm. And for this particular character, for Jack, um, he wanted isolation, and he got it, and he couldn't handle it. Mm. So what happens, I think, in, in my own experience, um, is that if 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 you're isolated, and you let the mind do what think it'll just keep thinking and bringing up stuff and thinking of this and thinking of that and thinking until you lose it mm -hmm. so to some degree i think that's you know he has other issues but i think to some degree that's what happened to him he he wanted this and he got it you can't explain why the kid knows the things he does yeah. that the phone oh the little friend mm -hmm. is saying, which I believe is himself, but mm -hmm. he just doesn't know how to handle his gift. Um, the, oh, this person's going to call and the phone rings. Yeah. No, you're right. Um, and I think it's the book, but also the miniseries with the like Encyclopedia Brown guy. Uh, but like Tony, like you get the sense that it's like almost future Danny, like talking back to him, like telling, like it's like this older, like more adult version of him. Is kind of how I took it when I read the book, um, and I think watched the miniseries, which now we made it an hour and fifteen minutes before I myself brought those things up. So that's okay. Um, but yeah, right. Like, who is Tony? What is Tony? All a lot of kids have imaginary friends. When the doctor checks out Danny, like that's what she says. She's like, it's completely normal. Did it happen when he started the new school? Um, and she's like, no, it was with the injury. So. But yeah. She doesn't know what. No, I mean, she, she doesn't. She, I mean, she is speaking in terms of scientific reality. And what we know about that stuff exactly. at so this point. This is what yeah. can be proven. So mm -hmm. the psychiatrist says that you know this is normal because this is what kids do. Yeah. But when it when does it become something beyond that? How do you measure it? And how you know how does it fit in normal society? Mm -hmm. So. If, if you can't, quote, prove it scientifically, then it does not exist. Sure. And science is a new science in a lot of ways. You know, we're still figuring out. Psychology is a very new science that we're still figuring out. We're going to go one, two, three. Um, well, first of all, one of the things that Kubrick has said about the movie, yeah. um, in addition to, like, you know, maybe not believing in ghosts, is yeah. that I think he said at one point he always saw the story as being hopeful because... Any ghost story like this imply that yeah. says that there's something after death. Mm -hmm. There's something hopeful about that, even if his after death is maybe just li you know just living in a photograph in this kind of twilight zone or whatever. That's more hopeful than the alternative. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I personally have never been very fond of some of the revisionist takes people have on movies sometimes sure. I've you know I've known people who say that um, you know in any given movie like the prestige or the shape of water oh no what you see happening in half of the movie that doesn't really happen that's just right. somebody's imagination or oh no she's really dead the whole time mm -hmm. or something like that and I'm Great. just you know and you know especially like in the case of the shape of water where it happened and I think the director has said Oh no! It's a you know it's a fairy tale. It's a love story with a happy ending. And the yeah. other and like somebody I talked to says, "Oh no, she just dies. That's the ending because that's as far as they can imagine in terms of reality." I find it interesting here in The Shining because it is possible to look at say, you know, how can the, you know, what is it? How can the door open? Sure, yeah, in the freezer. That, you know, that could be Danny. Right, and that's usually how I justify right. it. Right, and that you know I look at that and I think to myself okay, why would he open the door? Because, you know, he, you know, his father, who he's having dreams, is going to try and kill him. Mm -hmm. If he's locked up, he can't kill him. And he's been abusive. Mm -hmm. Right. He dislocated his shoulder. Mm -hmm. Right. I, you know, as a kid, I would keep my distance from him. Right, right. I, mean, I wouldn't help him get out of a... Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, he's in some sort of weird fugue state anyway right now. It's not right. Danny at this point. It's sure. Tony. Um, it is possible to come up with literalist readings of some of this stuff. Yeah. That begins to fall apart when you have, um, I think Wendy is beginning to see weird mm -hmm. shit. Um, I'm, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, this is basic, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is basic 
TV. I don't know. If I no, technically it's public access. People don't have to wear clothes on this if they don't want next time, but please do. Um, and I and I dropped an F bomb by accident like a couple minutes ago, so it's fine. Yeah, but I mean, we're gonna like, go here, here, and then. I, to fi you. I find it more. I find the lack of supernatural stuff throughout most of the movie to be interesting in the fact that it really just lends more realism and credibility mm -hmm. to when it does show up at the end. It reminds yeah. me, you know, the talk of there being like scientific verification. This is something that happens in a bunch of like horror movies from that period. Like the exorcist spends like 80% of its runtime with everybody, the priests included saying, Oh no, she's probably just crazy. Right. They take her to get her brain scanned. She's probably just crazy. And then at the very last minute, Max von Sydow comes in and says, no, it's a demon. Right. <laughs> yeah, like the first priest is like, no, we don't do this. You don't want that. Like, right. let's talk to the doctor. I do not believe in ghosts. I think science will find a way to explain it at some point. But with that said, I've had some things happen to me that I can't explain, you know? So let's go there, and um, then there, and then back to Ryan. Stated originally, so if I repeat it, I, it's okay. I apologize, but... So sort of the genius to me in the movie, in a sense, is the ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And sort of he leaves it up to any particular member of the audience to interpret it as they will. So I think in one sense, you could interpret it as completely psychological. Sure. And you could even say, you know, you're looking at the movie from, um, I forget the name, sorry. My, Jack? My, Jack's point mm -hmm. of view. So even the things Danny is seeing, the child, is not really what he's seeing. It's just Jack's perception of what's going on okay. in his world. And yeah. this is all about his world. So the discussion with um, the cook and everything that's going on is his interpretation or memory of what's going on. Because okay. if you do, and even the genetic, I was even thinking at some point, the genetic con um, connection between the father and the son. <coughs> mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of times the theme is mental illness, psychological issues, and the supernatural and the ability to uh -huh. have the shine or have ESP. And it seems to me that a lot of times they, they, they go hand in hand in, in, in terms of themes and movies. So a lot of people with special powers oftentimes have mental illness issues mm. and yeah. psychological issues. And so the two sort of go together. So How even the child can be having opens. mental yeah. illness and psychological issues as well. Yeah. And it could be a completely psychological thing, and both father and son have psychological issues, and it explains the door opening, uh -huh. for instance, in the freezer, um, or the dry goods, or whatever it was. Um, it could just be his imagination that the door was locked, or this was actually, that whole entire scene was happening. Yeah. So depending on how literal you want to take each scene, the more literal you take it and say, oh, that must have happened, and the door opened, then you'll have to sort of land on the supernatural side and the right. supernatural things going on. And if you just take it as someone's imagination, as off as that may be, then you could land further on the psychological side. Of yeah, that. and in that freezer scene, right, Grady's voice, we don't see Grady. Like, it's, a, again, a choice, and we hear the voice. And again, it's almost like very like, echoing. Like, it's almost like a voice in his head. We're going to go there, and then there, and then to you guys. The one thing I want to say about that is Jack doesn't have that good of an imagination to pull that off. He's a bad writer. That's a perception. Oh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I mean. He's, he spends, like, his magnum opus is a shit post. And that is, yeah, that's the thing, yeah. Because of the, his work, his responsibility, and what Sometimes he. Sometimes you just gotta write it out. Yeah. I mean, like, don't get me wrong, writers say the same, basically, your central idea, right? You're saying that same thing over and over and over again. This is just, like, stripping away all the metaphors and similes around it. But, yeah, we'll get there. Go ahead. Well, my big, this movie gave me a good solid case of the creeps to the point where I couldn't finish watching it. Oh, wow, because okay. Because it was, it, was, it was the slow burn thing. I finally figured it out just listening tonight. It was the, I, I had to At what point did you what give, happened. what part did you walk away from? How do you think this movie ends in your mind? What was the last thing you saw? Well, the last <laughs> thing I saw was the thing in the bathroom with me. Oh, yeah, OK. And I was like, OK, this whole thing isn't real. It just happened in, its he in his head, and he never actually made it to the job. 
Yeah. Um, with the woman in the bathroom, the first I, time I, I saw this. Not tell me what happened. Spoilers. The woman in the bathroom, it comes right after we get a Wendy in the kitchen or something, and there's a report on the news about a woman missing in the like sto snowstorm or something. Oh, yeah. So when she comes running in, and she's, I'm like, that's a weird detail to include. Because again, like, they're always using news and television to deliver exposition in a lot of things. So I, like, that's where I thought we were going to go when Wendy, there's a woman in the hotel. And that's not where we went. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, right, like, uh, movies like, what, uh, Taxi Driver, King of Comedy, right? Those are movies that are, you walk away and you question, did any of this happen? How much of this is real? And that's intentional. Um, and I, again, right, like, I want that to be this movie, but this is walking the line kind of to, like, what you but were I saying before. I figure out why he didn't tell her that yeah. he saw the woman in the bathroom. Yeah, I don't think he Maybe. told her about Grady or anything either. Yeah. Oh, my wife will love it. I don't think he mentioned that ever. Yeah. Because, yeah, and I didn't expect her to be naked, and yeah. I didn't expect a full frontal shot. I, mm -hmm. I was like, "What?" <laughs> she's creeped out by cannibalism. I don't think I think he was making that up about the you know oh she loves ghost stories. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's like, Jack, don't talk about cannibalism in the car. No, it's okay. He saw it on the TV. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, go ahead. Was it? Was it? You know, when all the shots were they were ghosts, weren't the colors more vibrant? Or was that? Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah did or anybody notice that? It was more real than everything else around them. Yeah, it was almost there does like tend it to was be a lot of red. Technicolor. Yeah. A lot of red and almost. Bright yeah, no, I could see that now that you bring it up. Like, there's a vibrancy to it because Lloyd, the bartender, right, he's, he's there. He's in the bathroom. Yeah, rather than the real people. Right. Everything's the, yeah. the, the other bathroom. Yeah, the in comparison. Yeah. yeah. And then all of a sudden, Gone. there's the blood of the elevator, there's yeah. the blood in the hallway, there's a lot the of red. bright red. Um, bathroom. I can't remember if there's a whole lot of red in the gold room, but the gold room is the gold room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. And then there, except and then there. Except at one point I thought the poster said the cold room. The cold room. <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it does look like that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know how this, if this makes any sense, but like the We're there now. It's tying fine. the past <laughs> slide to this slide. Yeah. So is it a psychological thriller, is it a supernatural thriller, is really the movie's holding a mirror up to you? Mm. Because if you don't believe in ghosts, then you're going to see this as a psychological thriller. And if you don't believe, or if you do believe in ghosts, you might be willing to see it as a supernatural. It's really just how you, your perception of this movie is based on you. I like that. And a lot of internal, like, to you. So it's really just reflecting it back on you. That's why he probably leaves it in. There's the one uh, break in the fourth wall where he spikes the lens, right? Oh, hi, Lloyd. Slow night tonight. And then he, let, like, he's looking at us, right? Like, breaking the fourth wall, making eye contact with the camera. Like, Jack, the character of Jack, he's, he's looking through the screen out at us now, right? Through that mirror. And I like the idea that the movie is, in a lot of ways, acting as a mirror for the audience, showing you maybe the truth, maybe something, uh, maybe distorting your view of something. So I like it, I think it holds up. Let's go there, and then we'll go to Ryan. I did like that, um, like piggybacking off of what you had said um, with uh, the perspective of Jack and this certain things, and I'm like, um, and the, the genetic kind of psychology yeah. kind of thing, and I feel like going back to the mirrors, yes. perhaps, you know, <laughs> it's good. You guys, you guys have gelled with the mirrors. Yeah. I like it. Mission accomplished. Perhaps you know, it's like they both have the shine, but yeah. the way his is working is being corrupted by certain things, and like this could be some way, you know, other possible future for Danny if he goes a different direction, and it's just kind of this, um, that same reflection of just like you know, what this power is, because obviously, like we said. The shine, the shining, mm -hmm. um, seems to be something that's not really questioned too much in this. Like, yeah. you know, the the other guy had it, and Danny has it, and he says other people have it, and we don't really like get anything that says no, that's not true. Right. Um, it doesn't have the same ambiguity that the rest of the the ghosts have, but um, the other, you know, it just seems like that same kind, you know, that trope of you know that's in a lot of superhero movies now too, like that this the hero kind of goes up against. The villain that's basically just a reflection of that mm. same hero and just kind of reminded me that you know with jack and danny and it's just i think jack has the shine and i take it you have thing. not read dr sleep yet not yet mm. <laughs> maybe because i like where your theories are um <laughs> here ryan sir uh i think 
it, uh, it had to do with uh, his comment a while ago. Go ahead. Uh, but I think it was about um, where the theory fell apart with Danny, or with um, with the door being mm -hmm. opened by the supernatural power. Yeah. And uh, how Danny was thinking, like you were talking about how Danny was thinking, would have been thinking logically, but like, uh, no, again, with the, um, with the force more powerful than, you know, either of them, it could have been, you know, like the will of the force being... Hmm directing Danny to open the door, but I think it was a bit of a spur. Okay. No, but like, again... Like supernatural spurring yeah. on yeah, it was a like physical thing. Control. Yeah. Like, Could be, because I think at that point Danny is in his, yeah. like, waking coma. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he may be just being, like, a vessel at this point. I like how Holleran describes the hotel as, like, you know, sometimes it leaves a smell like burnt toast, you know, and, like, it happens with places, and, like, I can I can get behind that and I can see kind of what he's saying there. Um, final thoughts on either ghosts or crazy people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like <clears throat> the movie is both psychological and supernatural. I don't think it's one thing or the other. Mm -hmm. Cause um, I think maybe the hotel is to an extent haunted, but also like his own like psychological him falling into this like craziness is kind of amplifying that as well mm. so maybe it has something to do with that like maybe there is a ghost walking around but it's not to the extent he sees it like that's his own psychological being like amplifying it yeah i know someone who has a, a big aversion to spiders and it's almost like spiders seem to seek this person out like they're, all, they're always <laughs> like we'll find the spider in the place they're at and like it's on me now um, so it's possible that like, yeah, like, uh, like lightning rods, right? You attract stuff. I always, again, watching it this time, I was like, yeah, Jack's definitely got The Shining. Uh, you could see it, he just didn't know about it, and that's why, like, alcohol and blah, blah, blah. But I also like uh, the optimism of the afterlife because, you know, they're having a big party, all those ghosts. They seem to be loving it. It's just, you know, yeah, and then there. Okay, so the ghosts. Okay. Um, I, I think that because of what uh, the first ghost, mm -hmm. what he did, he stuck there. Great. Because what he yeah. did was horrible. And what Jack did to his son was horrible. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, from a supernatural perspective, I could see why they would, you know, why they would be stuck there. The Overlook has a type. Yeah, yes. they got a type. Um, okay, it's similar. But it could be also, it could be, it could be cabin. It could be Could cabin. be. Because it's so, and they you're tell isolated, you about it. Yeah. and you can't get any help if you needed it. I mean, look at the snow outside. Yeah. The weather was also an isolating. Mm -hmm. It was always snowing. You couldn't see, yeah. you know, every, when they went into the maze. It's, it's like otherworldly at the end when she's out in the snow. I was like, how, how would she even know where she's going? Yeah. Um, okay, cool. She's in the, she has the, the, um, the. Snowcast? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I was like, oh, they're, they're not even, they're still not safe. Because how could she see? Right. And find her way. They said they hadn't, they were unable to clear the road. So how would she even know where she's going? No, it's true. And we look at that ending optimistically. She drives off. We don't see what happens to them. It is very left open-ended. You don't see them get to safety. You see them escape this nightmare into the wilderness, you and know? there's no cell phones. Yeah, no cell phones. Mm -hmm. Horror movies really have a problem with cell phones now. they got to <laughs> deal with those cell phones right away. Right, yeah, so same thing. It's always like the phone's not working because, like, problem would be solved. Like the ring. The ring. ring freaked me out. I, I like the ring more in terms of the mystery than the actual like scariness of it. I was like intrigued by the mystery. You had a hand. Uh, yeah, one of the things that you have up here is like the dog and the party goer, party goer, whatever is going on. There. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, no, oh, no, no, that no, guy. Okay, so the dog and that guy. Right I thought you were talking about that picture and the other picture. Go ahead. And that's been like I've noticed like it's been an object of a lot of people trying to come up with theories saying that this scene is supposed to evoke the fact that Jack sexually abused Danny or something like that. Whenever I see that sort of thing, I think to myself, okay, if that's the case, you know, and maybe it maybe. is on Kubrick's part or something, mm -hmm. but why code it so 
heavily so that most people watching the movie are thinking, wait, what, what the hell What's is going that? on with yeah. the, like, the dog costume <laughs> thing? It reminds me of, like, there have been lots and lots of, like, conspiracy theories about eyes wide shut over the years yeah. because that whole thing is sort of steeped in secret societies yeah, and stuff. Yeah, like New World Order, Illuminati right. stuff, yeah. Right, right. And, like, yeah. people have, like, said that, oh, there was some original cut of the film that tied this group together with Satan worship and human sacrifice and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And when I hear that, I generally think to myself, okay, if Warner Brothers had a movie by Kubrick about Satan worship, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have made him cut that stuff out. They would have probably begged him to do that more and play up, it, to, play up to it more because they would have said, okay, we can either have this weird sterile art film mm -hmm. about a questionable marriage or we can have tom cruise going to a satanic orgy yeah <laughs> so my feeling of that is sort of the same here with a lot of the theories i do think that there is a lot going on and probably even kubrick himself would probably shrug at a lot of what is being asked of him here he'd probably mm -hmm. say well, some of it is intentional. Some of it is just, you know, you throw paint on the wall and if, you know, you like the shape, it Yeah, but that's the thing it. about art. Art is something greater than the intention right. of the artist, right? Like, you create it and then you put it out in the world and it is open to interpretation. And all of those interpretations are valid because there is no objective truth. It's all subjective, right? Which means, right, any conspiracy theory is real if it makes sense to you. Because it doesn't matter what you intend, because as someone who has created things, no one ever receives it how you made it, how you intended, and that's not really the point. Yeah. Uh, the point is about sharing it. But yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's true, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why I was like, let's you know, stay away from the moon landing and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, that's sort of my feeling on yeah. it, too. Like, Sometimes a ghost is just a ghost, and sometimes <laughs> yeah. a and sometimes a and sometimes a kinky bear dog <laughs> costume is just a kinky bear dog. Yeah, costume. but I mean, Kubrick does like to like uh, nonchalantly <laughs> throw in sexual abuse in his movies. Like again, going back to uh, Clockwork Orange, right? There's that like abuse scene, right? And it just happens and then moves on. Um, yeah, the thing with the abuse in this, a lot of people point out the teddy bears and like how they're foreshadowing this. Um, we're going to talk about abuse, not necessarily sexual abuse, because it's only maybe implied or we infer it more than it's implied, but there's uh, a little more direct evidence in terms of like just physical abuse in a non-sexual way. Well, I mean, there, there's literal physical abuse yeah. that they talk about. Right, yeah, and that's what I'm referencing, right? And that's me making a segue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I apologize if I uh, didn't get to you, but for the sake of time, I want to make sure we talk about it. So here's... Uh, Things that not that kind of out and out talk about abuse, maybe. Jack is like shuffling through his different like tactics, trying to get out of that. Where he's like, I'm gonna yell, then I'm gonna like try to bully and intimidate, and then as that's not working, now I'm gonna switch to, oh, I'm hurt, and play the sympathy the sympathy card. Um, and like often, like uh, someone in an abusive relationship uh, does that to the other person in it, right? Where they it's like this. I'm yelling, now I'm crying, and it's your fault because you hurt me. Uh, I don't know. And that, that's like things I've, I've seen. Um, so Jack, recovering alcoholic, how long he's not been drinking is unclear. Uh, because if you go by what Wendy said, he hasn't drank since he hurt Danny. Right? That, but, but also, we get the three years, five months thing. Right? But the thing to Danny happened three years ago. So yeah. it's unclear, and it might be purposefully unclear. She never says that it's that he hasn't had a drink since he hurt Danny. Mm -hmm. She just says... She said you know, some good said, comes out of it. Right, she says... He hasn't that, had a know, drop since. She says he promised that he was going to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. And then when she says, and he hasn't had a drop in five months, that's, I mean, like... Well, she so doesn't say the five months line. She's, no, 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 yeah. no, she, no, she says it in that scene. No, she doctor. says it was the three years ago, the arm thing. He, some good came out of it. No, 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 He's, at the end of the, at the end of that scene with okay. the doctor. At the end of that scene yeah. with the she doctor, says she months. says five months. Yeah. So it's right away. But I don't think know. she says three years. He says three years, right? I'm not, I'm not. No, he I, in this scene, he says, here's the five miserable months on the wagon and all the irreparable harm it's caused. Like, I've seen this movie she, a bunch, right? She says, she says three years. Yeah. Yeah. when he was in preschool, I think. Yeah. She did, yeah. Right, so 
there's enough information there for you to know immediately that this is a promise that he's made and broken mm -hmm. a few times. Right. So, yeah, and I think that's kind of what comes across this, from the ambiguity. Right, yeah. and it, it's a pretty normal ambiguity because he's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. Alcoholics fall off the wagon sometimes, mm -hmm. and from the look of Jack Nicholson being his most Jack Nicholsoniest. <laughs> Jack Nicholson to eleven in this movie. Yeah, yeah, like he's, you know, he's probably fallen off the wagon several times on the way to the interview. Yeah. I, I don't know what how social service it was in the eighties, but I'm sure <laughs> if you pulled some kid's arm mm -hmm. and dislocated it and you reported it, that the way he, they're talking, perhaps, is that he had to do these things, not that he wanted to. Right. Is because that's maybe um, a requirement for him to stay around his kid. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, um, it, yeah. I mean, if if you're, I'm not an alcoholic, but we believe um, you. If if you're, <laughs> if but if you know you have a. Um, I have I abuse food, mm -hmm. so if you have an, an addiction, you know it's always with you. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't just go because you say it. You know I'm not going to do it. And I think at the beginning of the film, where, didn't they come from somewhere else? Um, yeah, they've relocated from where? Does anyone remember? I think he was like a school teacher maybe? from like it's somewhere northeastern. It's probably so, Maine. Yeah. Stephen so King so loves Maine. Because this happened. He had to leave his job. Now I, I'm, yes. I'm just putting, um, you know, I'm just trying to think of, but that's not said. Yeah. So it's just said that you know they had to, and so that's mm -hmm. what I'm. And he also blames his family for his inability to write. Yes. Yeah. And so that justifies to him his his abusive behavior. Mm -hmm. And Wendy defends it. He grabbed him just like you would any child, you know? Like, and it's just at that time, too much. And Jack echoes that with the, you know, millimeters of pressure yeah. per ounce, whatever. But I don't know, but yeah. in, all fairness to, mm -hmm. she, in all fairness to her, she's a victim. Yeah. So um, there's a certain way that she's going to, and she's not working. Right. So she's, and to me, it seems like uh, her sole focus is her child. Yeah. And keeping that family unit together. So I think sometimes um, she's trying to justify why she's, why she's doing and how could she get out. This also talks about isolation and abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. Because he's also, take, how do, you know, he's taking a job that isolates them all. Them all, yeah. So that he can do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. and have a nervous breakdown in the process. She wants to take Danny to the doctor, or, you know, what about me? What about, have you thought about me? You know, he, he's constantly, like, making about himself by saying it's never about him, right? And, like, that's he's another tactic. It's definitely a controlling thing, um, and often, like, victims of abuse will, will defend the abuser, you know? Um, well, Not well, always, well, but it's, I'm just uh, saying yeah. to look at the victim as... A victim, sure, and and you know there's a psychology to it, abuse. Yeah. So it takes a lot of courage to get out of an abusive relationship, because Bless the you. abuser has isolated you in the relationship mm -hmm. and had you thinking a certain way. So in order for you to think differently, which I think is what happened when she saw that um, her son mm -hmm. a bit. Something he said he would he wouldn't do. Right. And um, so, and then you question, did he do that or not? Right, because she's downstairs checking the boiler during that scene. She comes upstairs and finds him. Oh, I had a really bad dream. Yeah, you. It's left where but you could say. You going know. back to the viewer. Mm -hmm. That's what viewers do too in abusive relationships. How so? They, they question who's telling the truth. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, so he said this, she said that, the truth somewhere in the middle. But he set up a situation where they're isolated yeah. so that you're questioning who is the abuser. Is it the ghost mm -hmm. or is it actually him? Yeah. Because he's blaming other people other than himself. Yeah, it won't take that personal responsibility, even though he's talking all about his responsibility. One, two. 
You first. Go ahead. Like, I mean, I've seen this movie at least 10 or 12 times. Yeah. I never found it much about his alcoholism. It's certainly there. It's there, yeah. It, he is an abuser. She's a, she has all the hallmarks of being somebody who's been abused. Mm -hmm. So does Danny. Mm -hmm. Sucks his thumb. He talks to imaginary friends. I mean, it's all set up that way, but I think... I don't know how it plays into the film as much as a main feature, right. but there have been other caretakers. There's a caretaker yeah. every year. Yeah. The, the Grady killed somebody, so presumably there are people that do this job every year. There's been like 10 years and, in movie and time. And don't murder between, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that what that does, at least for me in this film, is that it just makes him the kind of susceptible human to be mm -hmm. picked on by Grady, if that's what's happening. Sure. Or he's the perfect candidate to allowed the isolation. I mean, alcoholics don't like to be isolated. Alaska's got, like, the highest suicide rate. Yeah, the highest alcoholism yeah. rate. It's dark. Like, it, there is something about all that that leads into it. So I just kind of sets it up to be a pro I don't even know if it's in the book that way. Is he that way? The, the, al the alcoholism is a lot more so in the book. Uh, Jack got fired from his job because he punched out a student who he found was, like, an a-hole in the parking lot. He was, like... But it also, it has a lot to do with his drinking, that yeah, being so the I, cause I, of that. Jack's father was an abusive alcoholic. So you get the sense that these are cycles, that like yeah, sins I mean, of the father a, visited on the son. He's a bad person. So he's susceptible to being taken over by bad thoughts, bad things. Like okay. I, I saw it blending itself into the regular movie, but not being a theme of the movie, or at least I don't know. Yeah, maybe not. I don't think either that this is like what the movie is about. The movie's some yeah. kind of narrative against like alcoholism. But I have right recently talked to uh, people who I guess they're struggling with whether or not they themselves uh, are alcoholic or deal with alcoholism, and they're like, you know, I couldn't get through it. Um, I, I, like, I, it was hard it's to watch really this movie. It's a really accurate representation yeah. of alcoholism because they're all good actors. Yeah, he's a good I guess so. So, like, it, like, if you were going to make a movie about alcoholics and abuse and this, it, it's, it's like, it could be that. If you took all the horror and mm -hmm. psychological stuff yeah. on it, That's scary it enough. Perfect. it's scary enough, like, acted. But... At the same time, like I just see it as making him the perfect character to sure. be. It opens him up to turned. it. Turned. Yeah. yeah. Or whatever. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Well, I was just thinking about in the beginning of the. You hear when he talks to her, the, the Shelley Duvall character, mm -hmm. you hear a lot of contempt in his voice. Yeah, from the beginning. Yeah. And, and also Phone call, the yeah. kid, too, which is like, I mean, you're like, whoa. Yeah, uh, he seems annoyed at Danny in the car ride. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm hungry. Well, you should have eaten your breakfast before we left, right? And there's that, like, edge to his and voice. He, he seems on her, edge. She interrupts him, and she's almost trying to take care of him, and he's, like, freaking out. Mm -hmm. He's like, whoa. Because he hates himself. That yeah. line, it's just, you just need to get back in the habit of writing every day. Yep, that's all it is, right? Like, yeah, there, yeah. he's... <laughs> She doesn't get it, you know, like, <laughs> but also I think a lot of it has to do with, and we've touched upon it, right, like, Jack's view of himself and what he thinks other people view him as, he then is projecting on Wendy, right? Some of the stuff he's saying seem groundless, right? Like, she seems nothing but supportive of him, and yet he doesn't, you know, he doesn't stop accusing her of not. Yeah, but and in reference to your question, yes, yeah. he's a very convincing character in terms of alcohol abuse. I guess so, I'm yeah. Sure he had a problem. Um, <laughs> I have never been a big drinker, but this is one of those movies where it's like, yeah, that's why I don't want to like fall into that trap. Same thing with heroin. I saw Requiem for a Dream, and I was like, I never want to do heroin. Yeah. It looks terrible. <laughs> but that's a different movie. Um, we've got six minutes, so I am not going to show us any clips about the power of storytelling. What I'm gonna point out is, Ullman tells the story of Charles Grady, daughters eight and 12, something like that, 10 and 12, someone, it's, I've been up since 5 a.m. It's eight and 10, thank you. Uh, Jack meets Delbert Grady uh, with twin girls. Um, I don't know, um, that's uh, an inconsistency. Ullman tells him the story of the ca caretaker right after Jack finishes, oh, I'm here to outline my writing project. Uh, the typewriter, um, Jack not doing any writing, not doing any real work at the hotel at all. Um, the book he produces is garbage, right? Yes. Uh, and yet it's a, in a lot of ways, it's kind of what all books are beneath like the fancy language and stuff. It's that repeating idea over and over again. I'm not defending Jack's work, believe me. Um, but on some level, there's 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 a lot of storytelling going on in this movie. Like we have the Donner Party, we have the news reports, we have uh, K 
cabin fever, the story, the ghost story, and um, Kubrick himself on a meta level, right, is, was struggling prior to this on what his next project was going to be. And there's the anecdotes of his assistant would just hear him throwing the books or the scripts at the wall as he was rejecting them. And like that frustration with creating is there. Uh, Faulkner said, kill your darlings, uh, kill the things you create that you think are great. And then we see Jack trying to kill the thing he created, right, his son. Um, like, so there's a lot of that uh, going on in this movie, and I don't know what to make of it. I'm not saying that Jack writes this all in his head and then it plays out, but if I were to imagine the story Jack would write, it is the story of the caretaker who kills his family in this hotel and all the history around it. And I don't know what to do with that, so I'm going to move towards final thoughts after you the say your piece. Consistency is yeah, what else? Story they were stacked in a room. Yeah. In one of the rooms. And where do we see them? Thirty-seven, I think. Mm -hmm. They implied it to be later on. Mm -hmm. Um, but in one of those flashes where like to Tony is showing Danny stuff. Yeah. Uh, you see them just strewn across the hallway. Yeah. Yeah, no, and there's a lot of that, and I think Kubrick's too good of a director for those like inconsistencies or continuity errors, like the chairs that disappear in the different scenes, like. I think he's too, maybe I'm giving him too much credit, but I think he's too good of a filmmaker for that stuff to be errors and not be intentional. And even if they were errors, I think like in the editing process, he's like, he made a choice to like keep those inconsistencies. It's not like my outside typo. Yeah, and then yeah, and then I wanna, yeah, I'm not gonna let you forget about that. Um, go ahead. Well, I think it's important to remember, in, also in connection Please. to the previous thing about alcoholism mm -hmm. is that um, the reason why Stephen King mm -hmm. disliked this movie so much is because for him it was a very personal yep. story about him dealing with his own alcoholism and wrestling with that and struggling and not liking the person that it was turning him into. Yeah. Um, and in the original story and the miniseries it's based on it, he wanted it to be redemptive where Jack has some sort of final victory over the evil powers of the Overlook and destroys it as his family mm -hmm. get out and he sacrifices himself nobly, you know. Whereas Kubrick looks at this and kind of sees it, I think he looked at that story in the same per way that we're supposed to look at the stories that Jack tells about himself, mm -hmm. that, you know, you know, oh, you know, I was just, you know, pulling my son up. I wasn't trying to hurt him. He looks at, you know, the story that Stephen King wrote and says, no, that's bullshit. There's nothing redemptive. He's mm -hmm. an abusive alcoholic. He's ne never mind the fact that he's alcoholic. Sure. He's an abusive bastard who looks for ways to manipulate and hurt people. Yeah. And there's nothing really good about him. He's a monster right from the be beginning. Like the fact that he forces his family to be isolated for a few months to begin with is sort of monstrous. Yeah. Especially since, and this is something else that I've always wondered, like, he's forcing them all to be isolated during the holiday season. It's like, it's October, what, 31st or something to whatever? Uh, right. April 30th. It's right. April so, 30th, right. So, yeah. right. So May like, the 1st, I've signed a contract. Yeah, go ahead. Right, so it's like, you're missing out on Christmas or Hanukkah, New Year's. Is Danny not going to school, I often wonder? Right, it's like all this stuff. This whole thing is an abusive relationship. Yeah. And in the end, the only bright, you know, glimmer of hope in the end is that he gets to be a ghost in the hotel. Uh -huh. But beyond that, it this is definitely the horror story where you're punishing the amoral person. And yeah. in this case, the amoral person is him. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, we want to see him get his comeuppance, in a sense. All right, so in conclusion, final thoughts. We've got 30 seconds uh, before Dina like starts yelling at me. Um, I think, yeah, The Shining's less about finding the answers and more about asking the questions. And I think that's what makes this movie enjoyable to me. Because it's like all art, the more times I go back to it, the more times I see stuff I haven't seen before. This movie changes as I age in terms of what I view and, how, and things I notice and how it resonates with me. But uh, it, it holds up for me and it, on some way is, is warning me about a lot of things and I hope that you heed to those warnings as well because again, right, the things you love, the things you love the most, the people closest to you, you can turn against them or they can turn against you and that's, that's a dark thought about us all. 
The scare and you, Sharon? I'm showing you the dark you side of me. You can't run away from yourself. You can't I escape think, yourself. I think that's the whole thing. You cannot yeah. run away from There's yourself because when you do, there you are. Yeah. I like it. Uh, anything else? Final thoughts? Dean is yelling. You hear her. That's why I took the ear thing out. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Uh, right, clap for, your, clap for you guys. Clap for each other. Um, uh, this would be really boring if it was if you guys weren't here and it was just me. Uh, I, please uh, come back again. Uh, there was talk about um, like something time travel travel related, maybe Back to the Future in December. Um, uh, next month, uh, it's November 8th, it's that Friday from 7 to 9. Um, and we're gonna watch a James Bond movie. Da -da -da -da. We're gonna watch Moonraker and see James Bond go to space. And this comes out like <laughs> very shortly after Star Wars A New Hope and is, uh, they rewrote a lot of it because of it. Um, I like James Bond because it's uh, a very like pro-technology kind of genre. But uh, I think we'll see some interesting stuff there, like besides just the interesting gadgets and stuff. If you want to have a greater say in what we watch, vote on the poll, or I don't know, make a good suggestion to me, like Back to the Future, because I'm like, yeah, we haven't done a time travel movie. Yes, sir. Why not November first? Because I don't, I don't, I don't know why, but they, I asked when was the next one, and they said oh. November eighth. Well, yeah, there's a conference on November 1st, and that's why. Um, <laughs> you're, we're, yeah, I'm not invited either, so don't feel bad. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you've been great. Uh, if you want to talk more about this afterwards, feel free. Thanks a lot.